Kathy Enderes, welcome back to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you, Jonathan. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you again. We had a great conversation a few months ago talking about a recent uh, report out from the Josh Burson Academy. Today, we're going to be exploring yet another new report, this one titled The Big Reset Playbook, Change Agility, just was released uh, and, and lots of great insights here. And so we're going to dig into this and really try to better understand the role of change agility and really even contrast that with change management, this kind of general idea that we have out there in terms of driving change within organizations. As we get started, I wanted to share Kathy's bio with everybody. Kathy Enderez is Vice President of Research at the Josh Burson Company, the world's largest community for HR. She has over 20 years of global experience in human capital, talent, and performance management, and change management from consulting with IBM, uh, PwC, and Ernst & Young, and industry working in companies of various sizes from Fortune 50 companies to startups in multiple industries, including technology and healthcare, and leading the research uh, on all topics of HR talent and technology uh, in the past, as well as now at the Josh Burson Company. She's passionate about making work better and more meaningful for everyone. And I share that passion. It's a wonderful opportunity to be with you again. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background before we dive on in? Yeah, I think you said it all. I think the the um, the background actually really goes into the change management area because I've worked on change management for the last 20 years. And I think we're really ready for a new way of thinking about change and helping people get through change in different ways. So I'm excited to, to talk with you about that. Yeah, excellent. And, and well, you just started to frame it up a little bit. There really is this contrast between kind of traditional framings of change management with what is being labeled change agility in your new report, The Big Reset Playbook. Why don't you lay out for us a little bit of what the impetus was for this report, uh, the research that went into the report, and then we can start to talk about the difference between this change agility mindset and approach versus maybe tr more traditional change management transformation types of approaches organizations have taken in the past. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'll go back a little bit in my personal history. So when I started working at Ernst & Young, actually back in Austria, where I'm from, hence the accent, um, I, um, um, I was trained on how they do change management. And change management at that time was more a project management discipline. So it was more around spreadsheets, tracking communications, tracking stakeholder engagements, tracking training of people on the new change. And that was all good and, and well at that time because change was more discreet, right? So there was like a change effort. We had to implement a new system for our clients because it was in client facing consulting. We had to help all the people to get behind it. We had to think about how do we communicate? How do we tell people why that's a good thing? How do we train them up on new ways of doing their work uh, because of this new system, for example? And then how do we engage stakeholders and how do we make sure that everybody kind of is on board with and, and sold on why we're doing this? And at that time, I think change was more of an event-based thing. But if you think about the last two years of, of our own lives, everybody's lives around the world, was constant change, right? If you think about the pandemic, for example, um, we um, we uh, heard, like, oh my God, we all have to be at home, right? And we can't meet anybody, we can't see anybody. And then we learned about how the virus, for example, transplants, and we all became kind of experts on masks and distancing and all these kind of things that we had never thought about. Um, and then we heard we can go back to maybe meeting people, but then we heard we can't have to go back working at home or being at home. Our lives changed, our jobs changed, and organizations had to change all their product offerings too. So um, change has been really a constant um, in the pandemic and also before that, if you think about digital transformation or automation, AI, any of those kind of things, it's not just one change that you can get ready for. So we really felt um, as we were talking with tons of leaders, HR leaders, learning leaders, talent leaders, employee experience leaders across many, many different companies, we have this, um, what we call the big reset, which is meetings with, um, with all these leaders in, around the world from big companies. We heard the theme of change a lot, like a lot of course, and it was personal change. So people really had needed to just like, 
could get some way of discussing what's happening with their personal lives. It was business change. It was organizational change. It was industry change as well. So change on all levels. And so rather than thinking about change management as a sibling of project management, we need to think about it more as a design discipline that helps people and nudges them along to adopt new behaviors, new ways of living, and new ways of working. So that's kind of the impetus of why we even felt we needed this change playbook, change agility playbook. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And maybe if you if you wouldn't mind going into a little bit more detail on these conversations you had, uh, you just listed, you know, a bunch of the people that you had talked to that led to this report, but can you give us a little bit more background in terms of the methodology, the approach to, to gathering the data in the research? Yeah, so there was a couple of ways that we did this research. One way was, of course, talking with a ton of people. So we had conversations, concurrent conversations with about 400 different companies and weekly, what we call sprints, five week sprints on any topics really that they felt were interesting and important for their businesses. And these were senior leaders in, in their businesses, mostly HR people or learning people, employee experience people. And um, we helped them just, somebody called that even the HR happy hour or something like that uh, on Fridays, always on Fridays in the in our morning on Pacific time where I'm at right now, um, just talking about what's happening in their companies, what's happening with their work, how can they help people be more change adaptable and be more change adaptable themselves as well. So, so that was one of the pieces of input. And we had tons of great stories from big companies like Microsoft or Lego or Rabobank, Deutsche Telekom, like big, big companies in different industries across the world and how they are helping people deal with all this change. So that was one piece of input. Another piece of input was a massive study that we did of 1,400 companies around the world where we literally sent them a survey on how they have been responding to the pandemic. And this could be anything from health and physical safety things to psychological safety, leadership practices, culture, people practices, digital transformation, any of these big topics. So, And then we analyzed that and saw what made the biggest difference. So we created this business resilience and change agility kind of maturity model where we saw what are companies doing, how are they responding? And um, we validated it with a ton of different interviews and people really, uh, and organizations are really in four different stages of their maturity of um, change agility, um, not just to the pandemic, to any big change. And, and the, the first level um, is more reactive. So they say, oh my God, we just need to really wait for this to go away basically. And for this, it could be the pandemic, it could be digital transformation, anything else. So people are, uh, in these companies are really just hoping it's gonna go away. So we call that hope for the best. And then as they get better at kind of more, uh, more used to adapting to change, they're protecting their people, they're thinking about their people, but more from a health and safety thing. And then as they go get more mature, they're maybe thinking more about the mission of the company and how we tie all of this change to the mission of the company and help people have some direction because when people are confused about what's happening they need something to hold on to and what the something is in these companies is the mission of the company so making your mission really part of everything you do was was one of these um like practices that these companies do at that level and we call it level three but the most successful companies that they're most successful in their change agility but they're also most successful in their financial performance customer satisfaction they outperform the competition their, their people are more engaged and they're more retained they are really change agile and adaptable and transform all of their practices constantly but without getting people confused. So it's kind of a balance of stability and uh, flexibility that, that these companies do. Yeah, I love that. I love the maturity model. I love the different um, stages that leaders and their organizations tend to, to be in as they're facing change. And like you said, the reality is change is inevitable. It's all around us all the time. Yeah. We can try to pretend like it's not happening, uh, right. but, but we're, we're all in it. And I think we, we recognize that if we're honest, um, but because some people are better prepared for it than others, it, it's an, it's a natural uh, reaction to, to try to ignore it or just hope for the best or just pretend like it won't happen. It's kind of like me, like I'm the worst when it comes to things like 
car maintenance. I'll do the simple things. I'll, I'll, uh, you know, I'll get the oil change. And if I hear like, if there's a major problem where I hear a major clunking or something, yeah, I'll take it in. But otherwise, <laughs> like if it's just little, I'm like, ah, not a big deal. I'm just going to hope for the best and pretend like nothing's wrong until <laughs> something's wrong. Right. And that's not what I should do, of course. And, and that's frankly, what many leaders and organizations also do with their teams they are like, ah, it's okay. It'll work itself out. Will it, will it work itself out? I don't think it will. Um, and so we need to be more proactive about these sorts of things. And that's where the change agility really comes into play because it's not about kind of the more traditional approaches to change management and, and transformation in organizations um, because it's constant, because we just have to recognize exactly. we need to be prepared always for the ever changing environment around us. And in one form or another, we're going to be dealing with change. <clears throat> so it's about change mindset. It's about um, being right. prepared to, to just continually be leaning into the change and continually be learning. And if we can create that kind of an environment, that kind of a mindset within our teams, then we're going to be prepared when the inevitability of change comes before us. But if we're not, then you're going to deal with the same old types of resistance to change that organizations have faced for forever. And you're going to have a really hard time pivoting and making the needed adjustments. I love the car analogy. I think I'm going to steal it now or leverage it as we say in consulting sometimes, because I think that's really the way to think about it. If we just pretend the thing is not going to happen or wait for it to go away, it's never going to go away. So you could either, it's the same as with culture, right? You either manage your culture or it manages you. And that's the same with like, if you're ready for any change, if you're adaptable, if you're flexible and tap into people's creativity and ingenuity, because they usually have the answer to any of these problems that you can't imagine because you're sitting there and of course don't do the work that people do, right? You can never be in their shoes. It reminds me also of what you talked about in the Deskless Worker podcast where we said, we can't assume we know what their reality is. Um, the reality of, of the desk class worker is different than ours, right? We are sitting here on our, on our podcast and we're talking computer to computer, very different than somebody who is working on a shop floor at, at Target or Walmart, right? So very, very different reality. And so we need to help people with their own reality and not assume we can manage that kind of change for them because our reality, our lived experience is not what they experience. Yeah, yeah, well said. So how do we start to shift towards this change agility framing uh, and approach so that we're ready uh, for the future of work? Yes, yeah, so we developed 10 lessons of, of change agility, and that might seem like a lot, but we see that it's not just one thing, right? Changing your mindset and your practices to from change management um, tracking and project management kind of stuff to change agility really requires to you to think differently to act differently and to also help people act differently and tap into the change adaptation that actually every human has I think one thing that we learned in, overall in the pandemic is people are incredibly adaptable we as people are incredibly adaptable I see that in my children they're 10 and 12 they didn't have any issues with the mask thing or with the disc thing. That, it's just like, oh, yeah, now we wear a mask. Oh, now we have to be away or now we, we have to be at home and now we come back. So they have been very adaptable. So I think that's, that's what we have to tap into. So we discovered these 10 lessons and I can maybe cover some of them really quickly just to, to give you a taste of what they are. So um, the first lesson is Thinking about change, not episodic, but really every interaction is a change intervention. So everything that you do, um, even if it's not like change management, it's a change intervention. So for example, this big company that we um, interviewed on their hybrid work practices, they're called Rabobank, the 42,000 employee international bank headquartered in the Netherlands. They're co-designing their new work hybrid work reality with their workforce. So they see every interaction that they have with their workforce as a change intervention on framing this new hybrid work reality. So how people meet, how they communicate, where they wanna work, how they wanna work together, they capture all of this. Uh, and um, they didn't help just tell people, oh, now you have to work hybrid way, in hybrid ways and here's how to do it. But they're learning with people and from people in every interaction that people have with each other, they observe that and then it shapes their hybrid work journey. So that's the every interaction is a change intervention. The next lesson we had is 
When you do change effectively, it starts with listening to employees. So listening to employees is the number one practice on many things that we study, whether that's diversity and equity and inclusion, whether that's hybrid work, remote work, health and well-being, employee experience. Every single thing that you actually do in the business has to start with listening to employees. Microsoft, for example, says um, people, leaders have to be not know-it-alls, but learn-it-alls. And that's really capturing this. And Microsoft, for example, listens to employees every single day um, on what their work reality is, what's on their mind, and then they take action on it. So rather than thinking about just maybe sending out a survey once and, and see how ready people are for any discrete change, just capture what people are saying and how they're feeling and constantly analyzing that and then also taking action on that. The third practice, we call that start a mission first movement, not a marketing campaign. And I think that's really, really important because transitional change management starts with telling people the what we call the WIFM, what's in it for me, right? Uh, but when you think about the what's in it for me, you assume you know what's actually on people's minds rather than tapping into the mission of the company and um, then framing everything around tapping into what, what inspires people to actually work in this company and then framing not a marketing campaign that sells people on the change, but um, putting everything into the perspective of your mission. Deutsche Telekom, for example, they say their mission is, I will not stop until everybody is connected. And that's very powerful, of course, in the pandemic, because unless you're connected to people, and they're obviously a telecom company, um, people could not communicate with each other, they couldn't get an education, they couldn't go to school. So, and honing in on that mission has been really, really key to keeping their employees engaged too do the work that needs to be done to keep everybody connected. Um, lesson number four is around leadership. So leadership is always important, change leadership, even in traditional change management, change leadership is a, a key component that you gotta manage. But here we're seeing human-centered leaders are really important. So people, human-centered leaders are those that think of people first and then the business will follow rather than thinking of the business first and then kind of pulling people along. So human-centered leadership, um, is really key to change and transformation. And um, what that means and what this looks like is, for example, that Dow Chemical, their uh, manufacturing company, they adopted a new model that they coined Design Your Day, where every employee is tasked with defining how they should work, it's meeting schedules, meeting protocols, technologies. Um, and they see hybrid work not as a policy, but a new culture. And leaders learn from employees how they want to do that. Lesson five is uh, around communication. So we say that um, you got to uh, communicate transparently and tailor the communication so it fits what how people want to consume communication. It reminds me a little bit of what we also talked on the last podcast. When you have a lot of deskless workers, for example, like Hyatt has, um, like the hotel employees, you can't send them emails because they're not on email, right? So can you use communication channels, communication ways of tapping into their apps, for example, or the tools that they use to communicate to people in the way that people need to see that, your workers need to see that, not in the way that you think people should see it. Lesson number six. Should um, we, let's, oh, yeah. let's pause there for just a moment. That's wonderful. Sure. Uh, and then we can go to this, the, the last five. Perfect. Yeah, um, that sounds great. Yeah, so so you just laid out some really important um, tips there and some ideas that organizations can start to to latch on to as they're trying to figure out how to go about uh, change agility and trying to build their their business resilience um, and, and move along that maturity model that you were describing. So I really, yeah. really appreciate that. We'll get into the other five here in just a minute. Um, right. Is there anything in particular that, really, in your experience, you have a long career in this field of doing change management. Um, what, what do you feel like is really challenging the old model the most out of those first five? Yeah, I think it's the uh, stopping to listen to people is, is really key because you might think it's faster if you don't, right? You're like, oh, we already know what's on people's mind. We assume we know what, how people need to be communicated to. We assume that we know what, how people's reality has to change. And we really don't, right? None of us knows 
what all the, the employees in our organizations really are experiencing. So I think stopping to listen, not taking a shortcut, not thinking, not assuming, and more just asking questions and, and um, taking action on what we hear, not trying to fit what you're hearing into your model. It's like, okay, like that kind of confirmation yes. bias. I think that's that's really important. I, I love it. Excellent, excellent. All right, let's go on to the, the last five. Cool. So lesson number six is about design thinking. Design thinking, actually, we just built a course in the Josh Burson Academy on design thinking. It has been our highest um, enrolled program ever. Uh, so which means for HR people, learning design thinking is really, really key. And design thinking at its core, it's a, it's a discipline on understanding your employees and, and then taking action on that rather than assuming you know what the problem is. So design thinking builds change adoption into the solutions itself. So building the right solutions rather than like building a solution and then selling people on it is really, really key. So design thinking at its core is built on empathy and listening. And so when you learn how to do design thinking, iterating, of course, as well, um, that's really keeps on building the right things rather than selling people on what you already built. Deutsche Telekom, for example, they've been using design thinking for over a decade, and they started with one design thinking pilot in HR, and now they use it for everything, not just technology topics, but like, for example, how they define executive com uh, compensation offerings for their German like, executives. Not really something that you'd even think design thinking is suited for, but they do it for everything now, and they have 600 projects right now that they use um, design thinking on because they use it for everything. So building that design thinking muscle is really, really key. And if you haven't started it, just get started on it and, and iterate and try it because that's actually what design thinking is all about. Um, the next one is around the role of technology. So technology usually doesn't come in very strongly in change management, maybe on tracking, project management, those kind of things on traditional um, change management. Uh, but we, uh, we really see that kind of um, nudging people along with kind of what we call, call nudge technology, putting behavioral change into the flow of work itself. So what that looks like is um, when you um, have come, uh, like we all maybe know these um, nudge technologies like Microsoft Viva, for example, as a prime example on our own, maybe meeting behaviors or something like that. I get these calendar things on my calendar that says you are better now take two hours on focus time because you've been in back-to-back -back meetings you can never think and those kind of things that embed change of behavior or change of um of like the ways of working into the flow of work itself is really really key so that kind of nudge technology what we call it is kind of lesson number six uh, not lesson number eight lesson number seven i skipped over that um breaking change into small changes, breaking big change into micro changes can result into what we call macro transformation. So thinking about a journey of like, not I'm a marathon runner. So if you think about the whole marathon, for example, it's gonna be overwhelming. But if you think about just one mile and one mile and one mile, it's much easier to do. And that same thing applies also for change management and change agility. So breaking it into smaller behavior changes, little things basically that you can also nudge around, that's where um, the big change can happen. Lesson number nine is around rewards and recognition. So rewarding and recognizing people for changed behaviors um, is really, really important. We, um, we see that um, for example, this company DCP Midstream, they are a oil and gas company. Um, they want to have people upskill to more like broader skills, for example, on their like maintaining um, like their machines. I don't know exactly what they do. Obviously, I'm not an, an engineer, but they want to have more people that are broad, have broader skills because otherwise their customers have to wait for a long time. If one machine breaks down, they have to like carry somebody over, fly somebody over, and like um like service levels are not that great so they value upskilling and they actually put their money where their mouth is on that so they pay people a dollar 25 per hour more when they develop these skills these new uh, engineering skills even if they don't up apply them immediately in their job so people get more money when they're higher skilled because they say broader skilled employees are really important for us and we don't just tell people you got to do it but we also pay them more so we reward them for changing that 
Um, and the last thing is about HR capabilities. So of course, we are an HR, um, HR development and advisory company, and we really see in this too that HR absolutely is the number one asked um, development area is managing change and uh, helping people adapt to change. But it's also the, the uh, one that where only 40% of over 8,000 HR people that we surveyed, I actually feel they are skilled. So um, really helping HR people create this change agility muscle is very, very important. And people need a lot of help on that. So th those are the 10. I love it. All of those are so, so important. Um, Kathy, it, this has been amazing. Thank you for giving us a quick rundown of the report. And I encourage listeners to go into the show notes, check out, um, link out to the report, check out the report, uh, connect with Kathy and anyone from the Josh Burson company uh, about this and, and other related uh, materials. Kathy, I note the time I need to let you go. But before we close, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Yeah, thank you so much, Jonathan. It's been so great to, uh, to talk with you. I always enjoy our conversations a lot. A um, couple of things. You can actually get this change agility report on our website. And I think we can maybe give you the link or something like that. Um, and you can download it right now and read it and read much more about these 10 lessons for change, um, change agility and the maturity model. Um, get connected with me, of course, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn and I'd love to connect with you. And I think the overarching lesson that I'd like to portray is biggest lesson of all is thinking about the people at the center of change, not the change itself. I love it. Thank you, Kathy. It's been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out and get connected. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.